Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find all that I do on my links over on Instagram. One of my accounts is called at Robin underscore Norgren, and the other one is called at UBU for Life. I'd like to start with a poem by Naomi Shihab Nye called Kindness. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go, so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it's only kindness that makes sense anymore only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to mail letters and purchase bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you've been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. Some thoughts from the book by Chris Gillibo called The Happiness of Pursuit. Discontent is the first necessity of progress. Thomas A. Edison. Lesson. Unhappiness can lead to new beginnings. If you've ever dreamed of escaping to a new life, if you've ever thought of changing the world, if you've ever said to yourself there must be more life more to life than this. You're not the only one. If you've ever felt a strange sense of alienation, a frustration that's hard to pin down, you've known discontent. When discontent sets in, it's time to make some changes. In a world where so much is possible, yet so many people are unhappy, there has to be another way. Five days a week for 12 years, Sandy Wheaton exchanged the most productive hours of her day for a steady paycheck. She worked at General Motors headquarters in Detroit, making training broadcasts. As jobs go, it was a good one, and Sandy was able to spend her free time taking and editing pictures, her true passion. One day, she and six of her colleagues were called to an off an off-site meeting at a nearby hotel where they had all been given the news. We're sorry, and we wish you the best elsewhere. Even though the automotive industry was in crisis, the news came as a shock. Sandy had always prided herself on being responsible and diligent. Approaching midlife, she'd never been out of work before. She was angry, disappointed, and scared. Sandy's first reaction was to follow the lead of her former colleagues. They had all been laid off on what was termed Black Friday among GM employees. And most were polishing up resumes, updating their skills, and asking anyone they knew for job leads. 
There was a real sense that if you didn't get another job quickly, everything good would be taken by the time they came to you, Sandy said. Then she took a deeper breath. For the past 12 years, the reliable good job at Detroit in Detroit had been taking a steady psychic toll. Sandy enjoyed the work but felt she was sacrificing herself, devoting her best energy to the studio in corporate America instead of the adventure that tugged at her heart. When I was laid off, she told me, I realized this might be my last chance to create something really different. What Sandy really wanted was to experience small town life on the road in a way that would allow her to create lasting memories. She wanted to find herself, and the specific quest took shape as she thought about a dream she'd had for a long time but never pursued. Sandy would travel in a slow, thoughtful journey on the classic American highway learn, known as Route 66, documenting the trip along the way. The more she reflected on her dream, the more it took root. In a journey of reinvention, she set off to see America in slow motion. Over the next six weeks, she took 60,000 photographs, one every few seconds from a camera she mounted on a dashboard of her camper. She slept in campsites, rising early to get back on the highway. After years of following the same routine of toiling away in a corporate office, the new way of life was thrilling. She'd been missing something, she realized, and the road seemed to open with possibilities as she made her way through challenging landscapes. Judith N. Kuntz says in her book, The Burning Word, In my reading of Midrash and other rabbinic literature, the name of Moses appears again and again. From the mouth of God to the hand of Moses, Jewish congregation proclaim every time Torah is read out loud in a, in a synagogue. Moses saw God in all God's glory, yet amazingly he did not die. He walked and talked with God on the mountain of Sinai. When he came down, his face glowed with inner fire and he carried the Ten Commandments, the first written words of Yahweh in his arms. Jewish tradition teaches that in his head, the prophet Moses carried much more than could be inscribed on two stone tablets. That during their mountaintop meetings, God dictated to Moses the entire Torah, not just the books of Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and Numbers but also every word of com commentary about those books that rabbis have generated down through the ages. Thus, Mo Moses is revered among rabbinic Jews as master teacher. Yet at the beginning, when he first encountered God's voice, he wasn't master or teacher of anything. He was simply curious. Now Moses, tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, drove the flock into the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire out of a bush. He gazed, and there was a bush all aflame, yet the bush was not consumed. Moses said, I must turn aside to look at this marvelous sight. Why doesn't this bush burn up? When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. He answered, Here I am. And he said, Do not come closer. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. I am. He said, I am the father of God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. A nudge of curiosity, a startled turn of the head, 
Moses' intimacy with God begins with a classic double take. Why doesn't that bush burn up? He takes a step closer to investigate and hears his own name being called out from the flame. Now suddenly, the frank gaze of a curious mind becomes a terrifying glimpse into the face of the one true God. And Moses quickly and rightly hides his face. Yet there he is on holy ground with the God of his fathers, and an intimate, difficult, exhilarating relationship has begun. When I look closely at this story, trying to read it the way a rabbi might read, I notice that it's only after Moses stops to investigate the curious bush that God calls out his name. Why does God need to see that initial sign of human interest before he can declare his own? Does God hide and wait because like a shy new friend or lover, he fears rejection? Or does God hide and wait because he fears overwhelming the human Moses, killing him just by his mere presence? Perhaps that is the meaning of the burning bush, says Abraham Joshua Herschel. Namely, that to reveal, he must conceal. That to impart his wisdom, he must hide his power. In his actions and his words, God continually holds out revelation, holds out wisdom, but it is hidden and we must seek it out. If you seek me, you will surely find me, says the Lord. I will be found by you. Moses had the burning bush. We have the Bible. This is the conviction that lies behind the whole enterprise of Midrash. If I want to come closer to the God of the Bible, to step onto the holy ground of its presence, then I must wake up my curiosity and look for God in the strange, hidden, and burden burning places of Scripture. Curiosity is the starting point of Midrash, and the question is the first tool Midrash employs in every encounter with the Bible. Questions lead us deeper into the test, into the text, into the smoldering gaps and the silences where Yahweh dwells. These hidden spaces of scripture open up whenever we encounter pronouncements that trouble us, details that refuse to fall into our sense of logical pattern or language that speaks, a question in us often mundane sometimes profound, sometimes desperate. In my own experience, the Bible is full of language that pulls me up short, makes me cringe, or simply strikes me dumb with confusion. But whereas Midrash calls the, read the reader to stare straight into the dark holes of Scripture and to use curiosity and questions to dig even deeper into those holes, my own tradition's way of reading has often seemed to do quite the opposite. I remember encountering passages of scripture in a student-led college study that stumped everyone in the room, that clashed head-on with our developing cultural norms. The first chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Romans, for example, condemning heathens and homosexuals. The verses in both Hebrew and Greek scripture calling for the silence and servitude of women in church and in marriage the God-sanctioned slaughter of Egyptians, Canaanites, and disobedient Israelites in the Hebraic histories and prophecies, and the bloody segregation of sinners and saved in the Christian book of Revelation. Fierce questions arose in our discussions of these passages, and frustrating arguments divided our group so deeply that the leader finally declared a moratorium on questions and moved us to scriptures that were easier to understand, interpretations that were easier to agree upon. I wish now we had recognized that in the midst of those arguments, we were on holy ground. Painful though it was to ask questions of scripture and not find answers that satisfied us, it would have helped us to ponder the fact that it was the text itself that raised them that by its difficulty, the text was calling out to us. God was calling to us through each syllable of these troubling words, inviting us to turn them in our hearts and minds and mouths.
and to be turned by them, mysteriously and uncomfortably, toward God.